uh, Ross Kennedy is professor of history at Illinois State University. He received a PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley, and specializes in the United, the United States foreign relations and international history from 1914 to 1965. Uh, Woodrow Wilson and World War I are of special interest, having written a prize-winning book, The Will to Believe, Woodrow Wilson, World War I, and America's Strategy for Peace and Security. Kennedy is also editor of A Companion to Woodrow Wilson. The title of his talk today is Rising Star, Herbert Hoover, and the Wilson Administration, 1914-1920. Please welcome Ross Kennedy. <laughs> thanks very much, uh, Tom, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to the Hoover Library and Foundation for organizing this conference. Um, just walking around the museum before coming up here, um, it's, it's really impressive. And if you get a chance to, uh, you should go and look at the exhibits because they're great. Um, so I have the first president that Hoover uh, was involved with. And I think Woodrow Wilson was the most important president that Hoover had a relationship with. Because without Wilson's patronage, it's hard to see how Hoover could have advanced as far as he did in American politics. It was because of Woodrow Wilson that Hoover went from being a relatively unknown mining engineer in 1914 to just six years later being a serious candidate for the presidency. In my talk, I want to lay out the main reasons why Hoover advanced so quickly during the Wilson administration. And I'm going to argue it had to do with his administrative ability, his political skills, and also his ideological affinity with Wilson. Lastly, I'll talk on why the two men had a falling out in 1920. Well, probably the most fundamental reason for Hoover's rise to power is that he was good at what Wilson asked him to do. Uh, he was good at the task that the administration uh, had him perform. Hoover was an exceptionally able administrator of large-scale, complex organizations dealing with a wide variety of war-related problems such as refugees, humanitarian relief, and the mobilization of the agricultural sector of the economy after the United States entered the war. Even Wilson administration officials who clashed with Hoover, and there were quite a few of them, uh, such as Wilson's Secretary of the Treasury, William McAdoo, but even someone like McAdoo would have admitted that Hoover was very effective at managing his assignments. Still, being an effective manager is no guarantee of steadily rising to power in American politics. What Hoover also had in abundance was political skill. To be sure, in some ways, Hoover was ill-suited to be a politician. He was uncomfortable being the focus of public attention. Uh, he lacked personal charm in some ways. And he tended to see the worst in any situation. Wilson, indeed, once remarked during the war, that he disliked talking to Hoover because Hoover was always so pessimistic about everything. Nevertheless, Hoover was a master at self-promotion, both in the media and with high-level officials who could promote his career. Since at least 1912, when he joined the Board of Trustees at Stanford University, Hoover wanted to get involved in public affairs. When the war broke out, in uh, August 1914, he immediately seized on it as an opportunity to realize his goal of public service. As early as August 5th, just one day after Britain declared war on Germany, Hoover was writing friends in the United States, cabling them to find out how he could be appointed as a special commissioner in England to help American tourists stranded by the war. And there were tens of thousands of them. Uh, often with very little money, uh, who were flocking to the American embassy looking for help. Hoover organized his own private group to help them, and he made sure that the press knew about it. He also lobbied Wilson's ambassador to London, Walter Hines Page, who was a good friend of Wilson's. 
to try to get the administration to back his efforts to help the tourists. Page and Secretary of War Henry Breckinridge, who was traveling uh, to England soon after the war broke out, both of them were impressed with Hoover and decided to make Hoover's group the disperser of government funds to meet the tourist crisis. Hoover's contacts with Page soon got him entree into the embassy's initial talks with several officials from Europe on how to help Belgium, which was occupied by the German army at the beginning of the war. Uh, Page invited Hoover to those early conversations and within weeks decided to appoint him to what became the Commission for Relief on Belgium, or the CRB, as it was known by its initials. The CRB set the pattern for Hoover's political style. To raise funds for it, and to pressure the Allies and Germany to allow it to function, which was not easy to do, because neither side uh, had a direct interest in helping the CRB. Hoover launched a massive pu publicity campaign to publicize Belgium's plight and the CRB's efforts to feed its hungry people. Since Hoover was the head of the CRB, this propaganda campaign became, in effect, a public relations machine for Hoover. By January 1915, numerous newspapers and magazines in the United States were reporting on the CRB's activities, and they were featuring Hoover. The New York Times did this, for example, in January, with a long profile of the CRB prominently featuring Hoover's leadership. Hoover's leadership of the CRB also allowed him to establish a relationship with Wilson's most important advisor, <coughs> Colonel Edward House. House met Hoover on a trip to London in early 1915. House had gone there on his first uh, efforts to sound out the belligerents on peace talks. And he was introduced to Hoover and was immediately impressed with Hoover's work on Belgium. Hoover then made a real effort to cultivate the colonel, knowing that he was an important advisor to the president and knowing that he might be able to help Hoover in his activities with the CRB or with anything else that came up. So he would feed the colonel, who loved information and gossip, he would feed him information on various European officials that House had to deal with in his efforts to sound out the belligerents on peace talks. House became a crucial ally for Hoover. He praised Hoover's work to the president and encouraged Wilson to send Hoover a note of thanks, which Wilson did in March 1915. Hoover thereafter stayed in touch with the president, making a point of praising Wilson's diplomacy with Germany in late 1915. In fact, during the first big crisis with Germany over the sinking of the passenger liner Lusitania, Hoover wrote a long memo to Wilson outlining what he thought Wilson should do, namely to take a hard line uh, with the Germans. <coughs> he was vaguely critical of Wilson at that point, but when Wilson's diplomacy succeeded in defusing the crisis, Hoover had nothing but praise for the president. Wilson, in turn, admired Hoover. Hoover was quote, a great international figure, Wilson told his, told his future wife in the summer of 1915. Quote, such men as Hoover, he said, stir me deeply and make me in love with duty. Together with the adoring press attention Hoover received <coughs> through the CRB publicity effort, Hoover's ties to Colonel House and to the president himself perfectly positioned him for a major appointment when the U.S. entered the war in April 1917. Just to be sure, though, <coughs> Hoover in the weeks prior to April, in between the time period when uh, Germany declared its intention to start unrestricted submarine warfare, which they announced on February 1st, 1917. Between February and April, February and March, excuse me, Hoover was in the United States trying to drum up money for the CRB, and he was lobbying Congress uh, uh, to ideally give an appropriation to the CRB's work. So when the crisis over unrestricted submarine warfare started, uh, Hoover gave a series of, of 
interviews and contacts with officials that he knew. He did an anonymous interview with the Saturday Evening Post uh, that didn't name him but outlined his ideas of what the United States should do if it entered the war. He also wrote a long memo to Colonel House detailing what the United States needed to do for its wartime mobilization. So he lobbied pretty hard for the job, something in the administration if the U.S. got involved in the war. He needn't have worried, though. In some ways, he was pushing against an open door. I mean, he was a famous figure by this point. Everyone admired his efficiency at the CRB. Wilson liked him from the exchanges of letters they had. And Wilson's closest advisor, again, House, was actively lobbying Wilson to get Hoover an appointment. So on May 19, 1917, a few weeks after the United States officially entered the war, Wilson appointed Hoover food administrator. And this began Hoover's wartime service in the administration. Hoover's job as food administrator in some ways replicated his leadership of the CRB, except on a much larger scale. Again, he essentially blurred the mission of his agency, in this case, food production and especially food conservation, with himself. He became a household name through the Food Administration's propaganda campaign to save food. And some of those posters are on display in the museum. Slogans, very colorful posters, food will win the war, you need to economize. A word entered the lexicon uh, that was Hoover's name, it was called to Hooverize something, meant to conserve, to save on it, to economize in the national interest. One example of the popularity of this was in the 1918 Valentine's Day card that was one of the more popular cards on that Valentine's Day, and I can't resist reading it to you, even though many of you in this audience might already know it. <laughs> um, so this is what the 1918 Valentine's Day card, card said. I can hooverize on dinner and on lights and fuels too, but I'll never learn to hooverize when it comes to loving you. <laughs> Again, Hoover, I just think that's great. Again, Hoover, Hoover used his leadership of the Food Administration to make new political contacts, especially among leading progressives like Jane Addams and Lillian Wald. He also had contacts with the New Republic, which was the most important progressive magazine of the time period, it was edited uh, prior to the U.S. entry into the war by Herbert Crowley and Walter Lippmann. Um, after Hoover became food administrator, his leadership of food conservation put him in touch with a lot of female progressive leaders. Um, he also became a direct advisor to Wilson, gaining membership in the president's war cabinet in 1918. Now part of the official inner circle, Hoover made sure to loyally serve Wilson's political needs. In November 1918, he even publicly echoed Wilson's appeal to voters to elect a Democratic Congress in the congressional elections that year. This statement, which caused a lot of controversy for Hoover later in his career, <laughs> evoked probably Wilson's warmest personal message to Hoover, a note saying that Hoover's statement, quote, touched me very deeply and thanking Hoover, quote, from the bottom of my heart. Hoover also tried to help out Democratic congressmen who were under criticism for the price of wheat that Hoover uh, fixed during the war. Uh, they wanted a higher price for it than Hoover set. Uh, and the wheat price was one of the reasons that the Democrats ran into a lot of trouble in the 1918 election. But Hoover went out of his way uh, to write notes, to provide talking points for Democratic congressmen who were trying to sell the wheat price that Hoover had set to their constituents. So he did some loyal political work for Wilson and the Democratic Party in that 1918 election. Although it didn't pay off, the Republicans won that election and took control of Congress. Given Hoover's efficiency at his job, his fame, and his loyal service to the administration on political matters, 
Soon after the election was over, Wilson decided to turn the Food Administration into an agency for the relief and rehabilitation of Europe. This gave Hoover entree into the Paris Peace Conference, where he became one of the most important figures at the conference. He was involved in several of the inter-allied economic boards. He was involved in distributing food to Central Europe and Eastern Europe. He really shined in this role, and he solidified his image as a humanitarian hero and an administ administrative wizard. As John Maynard Keynes, who was an economist working with the British delegation at the conference and who was very critical of what happened at the Paris Peace Conference, Keynes, in 1919, in a best-selling book he wrote about the conference, stated that Hoover was, quote, the only man who emerged from the ordeal of Paris with an enhanced reputation. I mean, I'd really add here that in some ways Hoover was the only statesman that emerged from World War I with an enhanced reputation. In addition to Hoover's political skills and his ability to network and to lobby officials who could help him and help his career, Hoover's political ideology also helps explain his rise in American politics under Wilson. Wilson no doubt found it easy to promote Hoover because the two men shared similar political values and beliefs. Both of them heavily emphasized the importance of free competition in American life. The engine of progress and the foundation of democracy was the striving free individual creating new enterprises and inventions. The man on the make, as Wilson called this figure in 1912. Neither Wilson nor Hoover, however, simply glorified individualism. Hoover stressed that individuals, excuse me, Wilson stressed that individuals could only find fulfillment through service to others. One of Wilson's most famous speeches he ever gave was when he was president of Princeton, uh, and it was all about service, Princeton and the nation's service, and how an individual could really only find their full potential and fulfillment through helping others and serving others. Hoover, for his part, he saw trade associations, labor unions, and corporations as expressions of voluntary cooperation and as entities that could spur further voluntary cooperation between people and between groups, both public and private. Both Hoover and Wilson also agreed that corporate abuses of power posed a threat to equality of opportunity. But they were confident that modest regulations on business would solve that problem. In this sense, both Wilson and Hoover, in my view, were very, very close on the political spectrum. They're both centrist, mainstream progressives. Both of them see socialism on the left as promoting a program that wouldn't work. Hoover thought that socialism would create uh, inefficiency, it would stifle initiative, it would diminish the character traits of hard work and inventiveness that he thought uh, were necessary for American progress. Wilson believed the same thing. Both of them might sympathize with how the socialists viewed America's problems in the sense that both recognized that a concentration of power in large-scale corporations could threaten democracy and threaten individual opportunity. But neither of them liked the socialist program for dealing with those problems. On the other hand, on their right, both men thought that 1890s-style unbridled capitalism was also a threat to democracy and to individual opportunity. And in fact, both Wilson and Hoover related the socialism on the left and laissez-faire economics on the right, they related them together in the sense of saying that it was the reactionaries on the right and the failure to reform that stimulated the far left. And so both saw themselves in the center as promoting modest reforms to fix what they saw as glaring problems, glaring abuses of power by big business, but they would rely also largely 
on voluntary efforts by people, especially for Hoover's part, on uh, in associations and working with each other. Finally, neither Wilson nor Hoover included African Americans in their vision of an equal opportunity America. It's remarkable the degree to which both men often talked endlessly about equality of opportunity, freedom, individual initiative and mobility, the ability to rise up uh, through the ranks in American life, but they never really acknowledged that African Americans sp faced very, very difficult burdens in doing that because of the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow laws that dominated American society. On foreign policy, Hoover and Wilson also had similar ideas. They both had the same viewpoint, essentially, about America's place in the world and about American foreign policy. Both believed in American exceptionalism, the notion that the United States was a uniquely free society and politically and morally superior to other nations. This exceptionalism meant that the United States had a duty to lead the world on a path toward greater pros prosperity, democracy, and peace. The two leaders also related those concepts together, prosperity, democracy, and peace. Both believed that a prosperous society would be a good foundation for democracy. Both believed that democratic societies were much more likely to be peaceful than autocratic societies. And that's a key linkage of those concepts because those ideas uh, continue to resonate throughout the rest of the 20th century uh, and indeed on down to today. Both leaders also despised traditional balance of power politics. And by that I mean they distrusted the international system that existed prior to 1914. Both of them saw that system as dominated by alliances, unrestrained imperialism, and arms races. Arms races in particular alarmed both Wilson and Hoover. Arms races were something that sapped the nation's economy, and arms races were something that primed countries to go to war. Because the more nations armed, the less they had a possibility to negotiate. It poisoned the, the atmosphere for compromise and negotiations to solve a crisis. So both men very much were interested in reforming the international system. Both of them thought the United States could bring greater order to international politics, ideally through some kind of institution like the one Wilson proposed, the League of Nations. Finally, both leaders distrusted European governments. Wilson and Hoover saw the Europeans as wanting to manipulate the United States, to serve their own interests, their own imperial interests in particular. It's amazing in reading some of Hoover's letters to Wilson, uh, how vehement he is in his distrust and dislike for the British. A really strong language in, in the way he described them. These were America's allies, the United Kingdom, the British. Uh, Hoover seems to have harbored uh, particular animus toward them because they had often uh, uh, been reluctant to cooperate with Hoover on his Belgian relief effort and they also had a different sense of priorities on food supplies during the war. But Wilson also distrusted the Allies. As you probably know, when the United States entered the conflict, Wilson refused to call the United States an ally of Britain and France. Instead, the U.S. was an associated power. And the idea was that the United States would continue to be sort of an umpire between Germany and the Allies, sort of a mediator, even while the U.S. was in the war. And Hoover, for his part, was very dedicated to America keeping its own independence of action. He wanted the United States to be free from constraint, free to decide what was in the best interests of everybody in Europe, rather than being tied to the Allies. Given all of this, given this commonality in their political outlook, given the service that Hoover had done the for the administration and his loyal uh, political efforts to Wilson during the crucial congressional elections of 1918, given all this, one might have expected Wilson to support Hoover for president in 1920. 
when Hoover return, returned from Europe in late 1919, there was already speculation in the press that he would run for president. Coming not just from Republicans, but actually mostly in the late 1919, early 1920 period, most of the speculation about Hoover running for president came from Democrats uh, or people sympathetic to the Democratic Party. New Republic, that magazine I mentioned earlier, sort of the flagship of the American progressive movement, New Republic was very enthusiastic about Hoover in late 1919, uh, early 1920. Wilson, however, did not support uh, this idea that Hoover would make a good president. And in fact, the two men had a falling out in, uh, over the course of early 1920. The seeds of that falling out went back a little bit earlier to the peace conference. First, Hoover in June 1919 objected to the treaty terms with Germany that Wilson had negotiated with the Allies. He thought the terms were so harsh that the Germans probably would not sign the treaty. And Hoover thought that would be a disaster. If they didn't sign the uh, operative game plan that the Allies and Wilson had was to either invade Germany, uh, or at least threaten to, and certainly to keep tightening up the blockade uh, on the German people. And Hoover thought that would just collapse Germany society and lead to total chaos if either an invasion or a continued blockade took place. On the other hand, if Germany did sign the treaty, Hoover was convinced that there would be such a political backlash in Germany that the country would also fall apart into chaos and probably a communist or militaristic reactionary government would take over. So Hoover urged Wilson to modify the treaty. He did this in early June in a couple of memos he sent to the president and then in a meeting directly with Wilson. Now keep in mind, this is after Wilson's been negotiating the treaty since early 1919, so for about six months. Very strenuous negotiations, very tough <coughs> negotiations that almost broke down on more than one occasion. So Wilson was in no mood to modify the treaty. Uh, when Hoover actually met with him face to face from different accounts of that meeting, it did not go well. The president responded very angrily to Hoover's suggestions. Apparently the two men exchanged words. And afterward, Wilson started to distrust Hoover. And he told one of his aides, quote, I have the feeling that he, Hoover would rather see a good cause fail than succeed if he were not the head of it. Returning to the United States in September 1919, Hoover put aside his misgivings about the treaty and decided to support it. He did so because he thought that the ratification of the Versailles Treaty, which included American entry into the League of Nations, because the way the treaty was written the first section of the treaty is the Constitution of the League of Nations, and then the whole second section are the terms of peace against Germany. So it's kind of two parts, but one treaty. Um, and so ratification involved both. If you rejected it, you'd be rejecting American membership in the League, as well as rejecting the peace terms on Germany. So Hoover wanted it ratified because he thought that American entry into the League was absolutely vital for Europe's stabilization and its economic recovery from the war. And Hoover thought that this recovery was important to the United States. He linked Europe's economic recovery from the conflict with America's own economic well-being. Unfortunately, though, Wilson demanded that the United States Senate ratify the treaty without any changes or reservations, as they were called at, in the time period. The Republicans, however, wanted reservations, and they wouldn't pass the treaty unless reservations were attached to it, especially on the League of Nations. As this became clear, Hoover urged Wilson to accept reservations in order to get the treaty ratified and save Europe from ruin. He wasn't the only person urging Wilson to do this. Other advisors were telling Wilson the same thing because Wilson didn't have the votes. The Republicans had a majority in the United States Senate, 
and the peace treaty to be ratified needed a two-thirds vote. Most Democrats stayed loyal to Wilson and would do essentially whatever Wilson ordered them to do. Um, but he didn't have the votes among the Republicans to get the treaty through with no reservations. So the treaty failed in the United States Senate in November 1919 and again in March 1920. Soon after the second ratification vote, the one in March, Hoover declared himself openly available for the Republican presidential nomination. Despite his work with the Wilson administration, Hoover had always looked upon the Republicans, especially progressive Republicans like Theodore Roosevelt, with a lot of sympathy and favor. Now, with his relationship with Wilson frayed and tense, to say the least, and the Democrats apparently on course to lose in 1920, Hoover saw the Republicans as his best shot at the White House. This further estranged him from Woodrow Wilson because Wilson was hoping himself to run for president for a third term, even though he had suffered a massive stroke in late 1919. Hoover's bid for the presidency essentially collapsed in May when he lost the California primary. But he stayed active in the campaign, doing all he could to steer the Republican Party and its eventual nominee, Warren Harding, to a commitment to approve U.S. membership in the league with reservations after the election. Hoover's big concern was that the Republican Party, and especially Harding, might drift away from the league altogether and want to reject it even with reservations. So he tried to stay on good terms with Harding in order to influence him to make sure that he still would support the league after the election was over, at least a league with the Republican reservations that they wanted. Part of this effort involved distancing himself from Wilson. In the fall campaign, Hoover denounced Wilson's stance on the League of Nations, the stance of ratify the League with no reservations, and declared that the administration had been a total failure since the end of the war. To this, Wilson retorted in a press statement that Hoover was, quote, no friend of his, and, quote, I do not care to do anything to assist him in any way, in any undertaking, whatever. <laughs> well, Wilson could be a real hater uh, when he got his fire up. Um, so ended Hoover's relationship with the man who had elevated him to the highest ranks of power in the American government. Wilson died in 1924. Uh, Hoover never spoke to him. Uh, I don't think he ever had a personal meeting with Wilson uh, after early 1920. Um, Hoover wasn't bitter about, about Wilson. When he, after he died, uh, he told, Hoover told William Al Allen White, who was a prominent journalist, uh, who asked him about his relationship with Wilson and, his, and had the falling out between the two. And, and Hoover said, look, I'm not going to criticize somebody, I'm not going to criticize Woodrow Wilson because I think uh, Wilson's behavior in uh, late 1919, early 1920 was because of health, uh, was because of a breakdown in the president's health. But in any case, the whole way that events played out in 1920 uh, pretty much ruined Hoover's relationship with Wilson. If his ties with Wilson were over, however, Hoover's own political career, as we'll be seeing the rest of this conference today, was just getting started. Thanks very much. Questions? When you say that uh, Hoover is one of the few to, or the only to emerge from the Paris um, Treaty with uh, his reputation enhanced, what were the factors that, that allowed him to come out of that uh, a little brighter and shinier? Um, this question is on, I'm going to repeat it uh, just so everyone uh, got it. Uh, why, why did Hoover's reputation go up so much during the Paris Peace Conference? Why was his reputation enhanced? And um, again, I think it's because of those two things I, I cited, that he's, I mean, he's really good at his job. I mean, he's very, very good at organizing 
extremely complicated transportation, supply networks, uh, uh, badgering, negotiating with all sorts of different political actors to get something done. I mean, he's great at that. He was really good. Um, the second thing uh, is that he, he was good at making sure people knew he was good. <laughs> he was good at making sure people knew about it. Um, and, you know, he, he, his position in some ways came across as non-political because it involved feeding people. It's humanitarian relief. I mean, it was political because his decisions about who would get food and who wouldn't in 1919, 1920 had enormous political consequences. Um, he only really overtly used food as a political weapon on a couple of occasions, and it was against right-wing governments, uh, emerging authoritarian or monarchist governments. I think it's Poland, if I remember correctly. Don't quote me. I think the other one is Hungary. Um, and in general, he thought that food was a way to combat communism. But that's more of a generalized outlook that everybody had at the time, anyway. In, in, ter in terms of a specific thing that he's doing, it's, he only really uses it against the right. Um, but, but his whole task is ostensibly non-political. And everybody else at Paris looks like they're grabbing stuff for themselves. In the public image, the way the peace conference comes across, especially after the treaty was published, uh, and, and especially after John Maynard Keynes started to publicize his views of the treaty, which came out very, very quickly. Uh, New Republic uh, serialized Keynes's analysis of the peace treaty, which was really harshly negative. Uh, they serialized that um, uh, within weeks of the treaty coming out. So the, the, the turn of public opinion, this image of the peace treaty as being overly harsh on Germany, uh, and I'm not saying that that image is correct. I'm just saying that that was the public image of it very quickly in late 1919, early 1920. Hoover looks like he's not a part of any of that. He looks like he was one of the only people, uh, or one of the only high-level people, fighting against that. So that really helped his, his image as well. Thank you. I have a question over here, and then I'll pass it on to oh, that gentleman sorry. there. Um, <laughs> From the from the seats, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you talk more about Hoover's uh, personality and his relationship with some of the other emerging world figures? I think more particularly about Assistant Secretary of the Navy Franklin Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and also Winston Churchill, who I think is mm -hmm. uh, a Minister of Armaments uh, or First Lord of the Admiralty, mm -hmm. and maybe David Lloyd George. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything along those lines? Um, I don't have a lot of specifics on that. Uh, on that uh, question, um, let me just talk just first, just kind of more generally, just about uh, uh, Hoover's um, interaction with political equals. Let me put it that way. Um, that he, and I think he actually maybe did this with 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 a lot of people. I mean, he was just nervous when he talked to people. He tended to look at the ground. Uh, he jiggled change in his pocket. He wouldn't look the person he was talking to in the eye. Uh, Secretary of uh, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, who didn't like Hoover anyway, because Hoover got to be food administrator, and he didn't. <laughs> he referred to Hoover as a uh, as shifty. He thought he was shifty because he wouldn't look him in the eye. Um, uh, so that quality, I think, made in some ways his interactions with political equals different, difficult at times. Again, though, what's strange about that is he overcomes that because he just kind of through sort of force of pointing out his, his achievements and his efforts and his focus on work. I mean, he worked incredibly hard. Um, his staff loved and respected him because of his hard work. Um, so so he, he manages to overcome that kind of social art awkwardness. And, and that's why I said even someone like McAdoo, uh, who's probably the closest figure to him in terms of importance in the United States, McAdoo was at one point, he was head of the Liberty Loan Drive, he's head of the Railroad Administration, and he's Secretary of the Treasury. Um, and so those two guys clashed a lot. But even McAdoo would acknowledge that Hoover was quite good at what, what he did. Uh, with the 
With the European statesman, he didn't have much contact with Roosevelt, with Franklin Roosevelt. Their past didn't cross much um, in this time period. With the British leaders, I can't answer specifically because I don't know, with Churchill and Lloyd George, the sense that I get is that um, Hoover was always absolutely committed to his sense of where shipping should go. And shipping in the Belgian relief period, he wanted, she needed transportation and he needed subsidies from the British government to do, to do what he wanted to do. And the British and the French did end up coughing up most of the CRB's money came from the Allied governments, not from voluntary contributions. Um, so it's not like he failed in his relationship with the British. He, he did get more or less what he wanted, but he, he came away from those encounters just not liking them. Uh, and, I, and I don't know whether they had the same view of him or not. Uh, obviously Keynes didn't, but Keynes was a lower level person at the peace conference. So. After the armistice and during the time of the Versailles Conference, was there any thought or effort about providing relief to the German population? And I understand they actually continued the blockade after the armistice. But I wondered if there was anything along that line that was even thought of mm -hmm. or considered. Yeah, they, uh, they did continue the blockade initially up until they start to lift it in March 1920, if I remember right. They, so they do end up lifting it. They, they make a deal that, um, which Hoover is important in brokering, to allow food relief in for the Germans. And in fact, in the armistice agreement itself, where it says the blockade is going to continue, it's one of the terms in the armistice agreement, um, there's a clause that says, uh, but of course with such supplies as the Allies deem the Germans need. So there's actually a, 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 a few words that's a door to, to say, hey, it's, it's according to the armistice, we can feed them. And Hoover pushed that. And one of his, uh, one of his key arguments there is that, look, we need to support the emerging democratic government in Germany. And, and this government's going to be in a lot of trouble if, they, if the population's starving. So it's crazy to, to not provide food relief. So they did, they do actually, in the peace conference period, in that uh, 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 early 1920s period, they, they do get food relief in, into the Germans. It's interesting here that Wilson has very little interest in that. Um, uh, in addition to Hoover, there's a couple other guys in the State Department Colonel House, to some degree, who urged the United States to do more to not just get relief, but that Wilson should give some publicity and some, some uh, rhetorical support to the new German government, because it's a democratic government. It's the Socialist Party is in it. Uh, Wilson had called for the democratization of Germany during the war, and Wilson didn't do anything. He never made a public statement supporting that government. He did not do very, had very little interest in the whole fight over the food supply issue, and uh, the the best article I read on this concluded that you know Wilson felt kind of torched from his intervention in the Mexican Revolution, and his intervention in the Russian Revolution. Those didn't go that well, and he his position was I'm not doing that again. I'm not going to get involved in the German Revolution. Hoover, on the other hand, was very much in favor of no, we got to support these this new government. It's an interesting difference between the two. I don't know if you had an opportunity to read the ordeal of Woodrow Wilson, but I think as the audience probably knows, Herbert Hoover wrote a, a study or a biography of Wilson in 1958. Did his image of Wilson soften or modify in later years as opposed to what you learned from the contemporary documentary mm -hmm. research during that World War I period? Uh, I've not read that book, but um yeah, I, my view is that, is that uh, as I kind of indicated at the end of my talk, is that he, Hoover didn't really harbor animus 
toward Wilson. And in the 30s, when Hoover's making uh, his case to stay out of conflict in Europe and advocating a position uh, very different from Franklin Roosevelt's, one of the arguments that Hoover, a big argument that Hoover made was that um, if the United States becomes involved in uh, this war that's brewing in Europe and after 1939, the war that's going on, if the U.S. gets involved in that war, we will lose our democracy at home because um, Franklin Roosevelt will use the war as an excuse to establish a socialist dictatorship. That's one of his arguments. And, and he, uh, as part of that argument, he said, we've already, Hoover said, we've already gone a step towards socialism with the New Deal. And he would then conclude you know, his argument by saying, in contrast, Woodrow Wilson believed in free enterprise and the striving individual. And Wilson made it clear that what we did during the war was just a short-term emergency. And Wilson dismantled all the war agencies right after the war. It was over. Um, Franklin Roosevelt's not going to do that. So he, he made this sharp contrast between Franklin Roosevelt and Wilson uh, to the favor of Wilson. And, and I think that Hoover, Hoover, you know, like I, I think had the same political outlook as Wilson. I think they were both centrist progressives as that term was understood in the 1910s. And so from Hoover's point of view, American politics had kind of left him and Wilson. So there's almost like a, a companionship there, even though Wilson's not around anymore. Other questions? Okay, let's. All right, great.